You are listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White. And today our guest is Lou Freeman. So today we're going to be talking with Lou, who is uh, a trailblazer in the field of aviation. Um, and now he is a member of the Lewis University community. Uh, I believe your title is Executive Director of Flight Training. Flight Operations. Flight yes, Operations. So um, D- Captain Freeman has had a long and storied career in aviation, and we were hoping that you would just maybe uh, share some stories about your life and, and how you got into aviation, um, maybe how you started, and uh, what you think the future holds for us. So where did you start? <laughs> <laughs> where did I start? I was in Army ROTC in high school. Oh, okay. And because my father had taught ROTC, I was up to speed with all this marching and twirling rifles and all that stuff. So so you're a military I, kid? I am. Okay. So I decided I would go to a school that only had Air Force ROTC and... I figured it was an easy A. I wasn't planning on going into the Air Force. That was, Vietnam was going on then. Oh, yeah. So um, why volunteer for something like that when you don't have to? But anyway, long story short, I took the Air Force officer's qualifying test, which was kind of an aptitude test. I did great on all the parts except for the pilot part. I did great on the navigator part because my father was an army sergeant. We traveled. I navigated. I loved reading the maps and stuff. And that was (laughs) pre-Google Maps. (laughs) (laughs) That was. That was where you were pulling them all out and following them. It was, it was, it took a skill to be able to do that. And that's why I did well on that portion of the test. The portion of the test that was for the pilots was asking you specific questions about airplanes. What kind of airplane has a V-tail, a T-tail, and all that kind of stuff. Having not been around airplanes, I I knew nothing. Right, so, I wouldn't either. So I didn't do well on the exam. And everybody said, no problem, you're a navigator. You'll be in the airplane with the pilots. <laughs> the one part of that that didn't fit was that I was not used to not being successful in whatever it was I did. Okay. And even though I really didn't care that much about taking the test because I wasn't planning on going into the Air Force, the fact that I had flunked part of it just didn't sit well. So I had to wait a year in order to be able to take it again. And during that year, I, on my own, taught myself about airplanes. So I learned about airplanes. Somewhere during that year, I decided, you know something, this would be cool, Mm. and I can do this. Had you had any experience in an airplane prior to taking these tests? No. You never had flown (laughs) as a passenger? As a passenger? Well, my father was stationed in Germany, but I was like two years old. So, yes, I went... I went on an airplane, but do I remember it? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you studied. Uh, otherwise, you st- we we traveled by car. Okay. So you took the test in the, the year after. I took the test a year after. I obviously passed the pilot part and the other parts, and the rest is basically history. I ended up um, going through ROTC and graduating as a second lieutenant. What yeah. school? The school at the time was East Texas State University. Now is Texas A and M at Commerce. Okay, but it's about sixty miles east of Dallas. And this was in the late sixties. I'm not that old. <laughs> when, okay, when, <laughs> when when did you graduate college? I graduated college in seventy four. Seventy four. I graduated high school in seventy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a Tuskegee Airman. <laughs> <laughs> Did you end up like, okay, this is going to show that I don't know when the Vietnam War ended, but did you end up going to Vietnam? No. Vietnam ended in April of 75. I was right in the middle of pilot training. Oh, okay. And because of that, they started washing out people, and washing out meant kicking them out the door and out of the Air Force. So it was kind of a scary time. 
and I happened to be in a class that was full of of Air Force Academy cadets, even though I wasn't one. The the main part of the class was, and to see your friends getting getting washed out was was a scary deal. What would they use as reasons to wash somebody out? Couldn't fly the airplane. Not Just having the knowledge. Not meeting standards. Not meeting standards, yes. Okay. So basically, we started out with a class of 60. We graduated 38. And fortunately, I was one of those 38s because I didn't have a plan B. I left home the conquering hero. Oh, he's going to go fly airplanes. The, I mean, the only kid in my neighborhood to be thinking about flying airplanes so I wasn't planning on coming back home with a car payment because every second lieutenant's got to buy a brand new car. Is that and required or that's just a pride thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a pride thing. Okay. <laughs> what was the training aircraft? What did they train you on? We flew T-37s and T-38s. They were both jet airplanes. The T-37 they called a tweet. It was a small two-seat jet that was noisy. That's why they call it the Tweet. It's made by Cessna. And the T-38 was, a, again, a two-seat jet, but it was supersonic. And they called it the Talon. And it was, it could go supersonic. It was sleek. The nickname was White Rocket. Oh. Because they were all white. But that was a cool airplane to fly. You spent your last six months in the T-38. You felt like a real pilot, especially when you were flying formation. And oh. you, were, you were solo and you were flying three feet from another airplane going almost supersonic. So Sounds that, dangerous. No, it wasn't. <laughs> it, it wasn't. I mean, You knew they, what you were doing. They weren't going to let you go solo unless you pretty much knew what you were doing. That's the truth. And they taught us what to do if... If you were overshooting or somebody tried to turn into you and stuff, um, but to do a turning rejoin was a skill. I'm I mean, sure. to be turning and the other airplane comes and joins on you, and then you pop the speed brake so you could slow down and fit right into to fingertip. It was it was confident. You know, you yeah. build your confidence doing that kind of stuff. Sounds like a rush. It was a rush. It absolutely was a rush. And you got a chance to wear a G-suit. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, so you, you really thought that was Top Gun before Top Gun. <laughs> At least you, you thought you were. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, was, that was just pilot training. That was. That was just pilot training. So where'd you go after that? I went to Sacramento, California to fly T-43s, which was a navigator trainer. But it was the T-43 is a, a 200 version of the Boeing 737. Okay. So I had scoped it out when I was in pilot training. We got a chance to do a long cross country, and I knew that was the airplane that I wanted. So I wanted to go see it myself. And that's where I took my long cross country to, was to make the Air Force Base in Sacramento. And and that was really cool because all the other all the other T thirty eights from the other flight schools came out to Mather too because Mather had a officers club and they have on Fridays it was J O C night, junior officers club night. So all the pilots from that were flying these airplanes would show up on base and it was a navigator base, so everybody that was actually stationed on base pretty much was a navigator. So there again, you really thought you were hot stuff, showing, <laughs> showing up in your little white jet, you know. <laughs> you're making it sound like you're just like, I'm just going to take the military plane for a night out at the navigator base. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you did, but that was part of the job. You had to go cross country. So I went out there and I took a look at the T-43 and it wasn't too big. It wasn't too small. It was exactly right. Nice. And I was, I was, even though I loved all that flying fast and rejoining and stuff, 
the idea of somebody shooting at me and me having to try to eject because I was always a big guy. I figured if I have to eject in a hurry, I was going to lose some knees, and I wasn't interested in that. (laughs) So I didn't want to fight her, but the the T thirty the F I mean the T forty three was a good sized airplane. It wasn't a big transport airplane like a C one forty one or C five, and it definitely wasn't a bomber like a B fifty two. No way. I didn't want those things. So that was my airplane. I picked it out, and then I talked all my classmates out of it. And that was easy to do because they were all from the academy. They all wanted to be fighter pilots. And Ah. so it's like, you know what? This little T-43 over here in the corner, you don't want that. (laughs) (laughs) So (laughs) I got a chance to have it. So how how long were you in the Air Force before you left for a commercial pilot? I was in the Air Force six years, one year in Lubbock and pilot training, and then I did my five-year commitment after pilot training. Okay. Any deployments overseas? No, we guarded the West Coast of the United States. And successfully, I should say. Exactly (laughs) right. (laughs) Nobody trespassed on our territory. (laughs) So, nope, that was it. And it was a fun airplane to fly. Uh, We did, we would take the NAV students over to Hawaii and spend the weekend a lot of times. And that was fun. And then we would go to some other places and but for the most part, we'd go out for two and a half hours, turn around, come back two and a half hours. That was the main job. And we were we were driving the bus and the navigators were telling us where to go. Ah. So it was it wasn't a hard job. It really wasn't. The hardest part was figuring out what you wanted in your box lunch. <laughs> How was the transition from uh, the Air Force to uh, civilian um, pilots? It was actually pretty easy. The reason being was that I was flying 737 still. So I knew how to fly the airplane. And the second thing was my whole squadron had come down from from Mather in Sacramento to Southwest. So even one of my squadron commanders was was down there already. And they were all saying, Lou, if you, if you like Mather, you're going to love Southwest. So they were talking me into it. And I'm thinking, hmm, I'm from Texas. I'm from, I was actually from Dallas, and that's, that was the only crew base we had. So I, it I was, was Love Field. Is that what it was? Love Field. Exactly. So I was able to fly from home and, um, hang out with my buddies I knew from the Air Force. So it was going to be a good deal. Yeah, it sounds like it. And then um, the um, the night that uh, Mount St. Helena erupted. Uh, erupted, I was over in Hawaii with a bunch of navigators from Shreveport, Louisiana, Barksdale. And they took them half the day to figure out whether we could fly or not because – They didn't want the um, volcanic ash to eat up the airplane and the engines. It's kind of like sandpaper. Yeah. Uh, So they said, well, if you come back through Southern California, you could do it, but you might not have crew duty today. Mm. I'm like, we're going to get this done. So (laughs) we planned. Everybody had a job to do. So we stopped in Southern California. We got gas. We refiled and went nonstop to Louisiana, did the same thing. Everybody, boom, 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 boom. And we were off again going across the Texas panhandle when somebody came on the radio and said, Lou, is that you? And I'm like, yeah. He says, well, this is John. When are you coming down? And that was in May. I usually went home in June anyway for my birthday and for Juneteenth. And um, I told him. In June, they said, well, come over and I'll show you Southwest and all that stuff. So I'm like, okay, cool. And he did. And then um, he offered to write a letter for me because it's Southwest. It was all nepotism at the time. You had to know somebody in order to get in the door. 
And John wasn't the person I would have picked to write my letter. <laughs> but when somebody offers, you don't say, nah, that's okay. I'd rather get this guy over here. Right. But he wrote a letter. It wasn't very long. It was short. But he had all the guys to sign it. And so they called me to come for an interview. And just as I was, you know, packing, getting ready to leave to come down for an interview, I got a call from the executive assistant to the flight managers. And she said, bring your black shoes and your blue pants and, you know, come on down. And I'm like, I'm coming down for an interview. And she says, well, unless you screw it up, you got the job. Ah. And then that puts pressure on you, believe it or not. Yeah. I mean, you'd rather just say, hey, I'm going to go in there and do my best. And if I get it, I get it. If I don't, I don't. But going into a job saying, I already have it and something might come out of my mouth <laughs> that's that going to mess it. this up. That's pressure, believe it or not. You and you flew at Southwest for over thirty years, didn't you? For thirty six years, yes. And uh, but anyway, that was my start at Southwest. And my interview, I was just chatting with the flight manager, and he called the other flight manager in and he says, "Hey, this is Lou. He's going to be in our class November tenth." And I'm like, "I thought I was interviewing." <laughs> he pulled that letter out and said, "If these guys want you." We want you. You're like, don't I have the option to accept or not? <laughs> no, at that point, it was too late. <laughs> he was uh, in. But it made me know that every day is an interview. So yeah. you have to show up wherever it is you are with your A game every day. And you have to present yourself that way because otherwise you end up with – you know, a rejection letter, and you don't even know why. Yeah, that's so, a good that's a good take home message for sure. So really, yep, and I loved every minute of Southwest. That's great. Um, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Lewis University. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit, visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. This has been Science Coast with Mallory Havens and, and Chris White and Lou Freeman. Thanks. <laughs> Bye.